special time in the sports calendar is underway. The hope and optimism of spring leads to a bevy of options. Baseball season has started. The NBA playoffs have begun with haste. And the NHL playoffs are just around the bend. Attending any of these events are a special phenomenon, but don't allow yourself to be ripped off in the process. With SeatGeek the sponsor of this video, you can be comforted by an unpillaged wallet. The resale market is treacherous. And with SeatGeek sorting and color coding all tickets on a 1 to 10 scale, you'll be sure to get the right fit. Tickets are actively vetted and confirmed for authenticity, which means not getting pulled for a fast one. The time is now if you want to experience live sports for yourself. And when you use the code TREE in the link below, you'll save $20 off your first purchase. With SeatGeek, there was no need to fear spending a fortune for tickets, only to enjoy the game. And for you to hopefully enjoy this video. Even if you don't follow the NBA, 2016 is an offseason that will live in infamy. We've talked about how ridiculous that NHL free agency class was, but the NBA's version makes that one feel like a skinflint splurging on penny candy at a thrift store. There's a good reason for the insanity. Their salary cap went up a whopping $24 million that offseason. The salary floor had become $14 million more than the last season's cap. New television contracts and a burgeoning Chinese market resulted in a financial windfall. And the NBA wanted to increase pay scales gradually, $10 million per year over four years. However, the Players Association didn't agree. They were raked over the coals in 2011 and wanted to make sure they get their pound of flesh in return. In negotiations, they forced the NBA to bend over backwards and shift insane amounts of power to the Players Association. I get that the league is a soft cap and few players to pay, but when I think of 2016, I think of the absolute worst the league has to offer. I bet you have an idea why I say this, right? Kevin Durant? Let me stop you right there. KD's move to Golden State isn't the reason why I think this. It was a relatively mockable move that fucked the league, but think of basketball culture. There are two tiers of player. Those that have rings and those that don't. If you don't have one, your legacy is extremely tainted. You are incessantly shit on for joking and everything you do is questioned. It's the alpha and omega of conversation. You don't start with stats. You start with the number of championships. With the massive jump in the cap, KD was still getting a pay raise from the Warriors. So in those regards, KD just did what he had to do. I think he's sleeping well at night with the pay he's getting from the Nets. Now that most of you have probably turned off the video for lack of KD slander, the real reason why this free agency class was ridiculous was because, thanks to bidding wars, a bunch of players got paid way, way, way too much. The result was some of the most heinous burning of money since Zimbabwe's hyperinflation and a long-term ripple effect that wrecked many teams in its wake. The only way to do this is to go over the most notable examples one by one. Irving drives, hop step inside, blows it up, misses, rebound taken by Iguodala. Iguodala to Curry, back to Iguodala, up for the layup, oh, blocked by James! The first example isn't the most egregious, but call it an appetizer of what is to come. Mike Conley is a solid player, that in itself can't be denied. A strong presence on the court, good all-around shooting game, and positive locker room presence. However, would you consider him worthy of earning the richest contract in NBA history to that point? $153 million for five years? For a guy who had never made an all-star team? You now see the dilemma facing small market teams. They had to pay these exorbitant sums to keep players or else another suitor was going to do it. They were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. The thing with Mike Conley is that he's a great piece for a team that needs more oomph to get to a championship. The Grizzlies weren't at that point. Conley himself did well, but it was still overpriced for a team that fell apart. He shipped him off to Utah in 2019, but that was more on Memphis trying to rebuild than anything else. He's holding his own over there. I just wish the Jazz would win something besides agony. Toronto had made the conference finals before getting smoked by LeBron and his buddies, so they had no choice but to keep the gang around. That included DeMar DeRozan, for five years and $139 million. He at least made all-star teams, so it justified the price tag. The problem was that it didn't solve their issues. Ever wonder why they call him DeMar DeChokesen? Because he wasn't able to elevate the Raptors to greatness. Although I should have sympathy for this signing. For without it, Toronto would never have been able to trade for Kawhi, thus leading to a championship. In hindsight, it was honestly one of the better signings of this free agent class. From a certain point of view. Andre Drummond is the kind of player you'd expect to be an outright superstar with his attributes and skills. You'd believe a double-double machine like him would be an outstanding piece to build off of, but it just never happened. Detroit paid him well. 
five years and $130 million worth of it. However, after that, it was nothing but accusations of laziness, bad pistons, teams of failure to mesh with Blake Griffin, and eventually being traded to the Cavs to get out of his contract. Now, despite that talent, he's mired as a backup. A hopefully well-off financially backup, but this man should be a lot more than what he is. Frustrating in the most literal sense. Here is the part where we move deeper into the rabbit hole of insanity. Nick Batum in his contract year was a solid role player and swingman for the Hornets. However, anyone who was going to be in contention for his services would have to grossly overpay for him. Sensing danger and fears of derision, Charlotte threw five years and $120 million at him. $24 million a year. For Nick Batum. It only got worse from there. His production would fall off a cliff. Became both unplayable and a poster child for the woes of the Hornets franchise. Which is also relatively unplayable. He would unsurprisingly exercise his fifth year option, which forced Charlotte to enact a poison pill just to get rid of him. Nick's with the Clippers now, and he's not at his peak, but he's returned to a much better form. He's useful when he's not being paid a ridiculous sum. I only wish I could be Nick Batum. Or at least have his bank account and investing portfolios. Batum wasn't the only player the Hornets locked themselves into mediocrity with. The other was Marvin Williams. Dude was coming off a respectable season in respect to him, but in regards to all things Charlotte, they threw way too much to keep him around. Over 13 million a season for Marvin Williams. The sad part is that he wasn't even the most egregious signing on his own team. He at least played at a respectable level for the contract. It wasn't good enough to get the Hornets anywhere, but you can't blame him for trying. He cut in the final year of his deal to get a chance to win a ring elsewhere, but it didn't work out. He's now retired, with a hopefully nice cushion to live out the rest of his life with. When you step into the ring with Dwight Howard, you don't know what you're going to get. You may get the incredible talent that he's blessed with, but you may also infect your team with metastatic cancer in the process. The Atlanta Hawks were desperate to remain competitive, but didn't want to pay the big bucks to Al Horford. And they took a chance on Howard despite him running himself out of town nearly everywhere he went. It may have been his hometown, but he meshed with the team so well that he was traded to Charlotte a year after signing to get him the hell out. His teammates cried in celebration when they found out the bad man was gone. He'd be traded to the Nets a year later, where he would be immediately waived. He did manage to get a ring with the 2020 Mickey Mouse squad, so it kind of worked out for him in the end. Atlanta really believed they were just a few pieces away from truly competing. Kent Bazemore picked a really good time to have a career season. For him, not the Hawks. They had to desperately overpay to keep him. And four years and 70 million dollars was enough to do it. Just like nearly every other contract signed this offseason, it didn't work out. Bazemore didn't decline, he was just inefficient and not worth $17.5 million yearly. It resulted in him being traded for Evan Turner's money pit. Then traded to hell in Sacramento to end the deal. He's still in the league, but slowly facing out of a starting role. At least he got paid. The Lakers were in a stage that their entitled fanbase had never experienced before. No one wanted to come there. At this point in time, Kobe ball hogged his way to a nice retirement ceremony and LA needed to rebuild. So for them, their answer was to throw money at anyone who wanted to deal with the bullshit of it. You think you're getting elite players? <laughs> no, try a declining Luol Deng. For four years and 72 million dollars. He did so well he lasted one whole season of subpar starting play before being cut. The buyout was so long the Lakers are finally free of it. After failing to petition to have his contract stricken from the record. Excellent success. Deng was a disaster, but if you thought that was bad enough for them... The Lakers got in on the two terribly aging players for one special. Timofey Mozhgov is the next piece to add, thanks to their desperate need for a big man. A body is all that Mozhgov offered, LA. To add to a previous season where he did next to nothing, Mozhgov did even less than that for them. All for four years and 64 million dollars. The contract was such an albatross that the Lakers were forced to dangle D'Angelo Russell to get the Brooklyn Nets to eat it the next year. This is why you don't sign players with crippling knee injuries to $15 million annually. You can point right to this free agency class as to why the Trailblazers have never been able to ascend to championship status. They locked themselves into these awful contracts that they had a hard time getting out of without mortgaging their soul. The first example is Alan Crabb. For this case, Crab's contract wasn't their fault, but that of Brooklyn. They offered him a four-year, $75 million deal. 
Apparently scoring 10 points a game off the bench is worthy of paying over 18 million a year to. The problem is that Portland developed FOMO for this bench player and matched the contract. He did his best, but he was nowhere close to meeting that outrageous sum. Portland traded him to Brooklyn a year later for another awful deal of this class in Andrew Nicholson. They'll still be paying that man's buyout until 2024. Crab was alright in Brooklyn, but injuries gradually knocked him out of the game. However, I can't blame him for securing the bag. Evan Turner is the player Portland's fans point to as the impetus for their failure. Turner had shown flashes of brilliance, but lacked consistency at any point in his career. Drinking stupid juice, the Trailblazers felt he was the missing piece. This player is a bench guy who had a season where he benefited from a good defensive system and can't shoot threes! Let's pay him 17 and a half million dollars per year! Do you now see why Portland couldn't support Damian Lillard? Because they're hoping Evan Turner played like he did in Philadelphia. Which he didn't. They were finally free of him in 2019 by trading him for another god-awful signing from the 2016 class in Kent Bazemore. A merry-go-round of shitty contracts. Shit keeps coming down the pipe. Mo Harkless was the next winner of the NBA lottery. One decent season off the bench, plus a team desperate to keep the gang together equals making over $10 million a season. To be fair, he did get starting minutes in 2016 and 17, and he did average 10 points per game, but he wasn't anything spectacular. Mo was eventually traded off to the Clippers in the trade that brought Hassan Whiteside to Portland, and then be cast off to where all good careers die. The Knicks. Currently, he's now toiling on the NBA's equivalent of the final stop, the Sacramento Kings. Do you remember where you were when you remembered Festus Azeli was a trailblazer? Probably here since you haven't heard that name in years. It's easy to forget. He never played a game for Portland. Dead serious. He was injured the whole damn time. They got buyer's remorse after a year and was immediately waived after the fact, but this signing is simply terrible for that. At least the other players on these awful deals played for their teams. Festus, on the other hand, wouldn't play professionally again until 2021. In the G League. He played two games. Fucking injuries, man. Same situation as Mo Harkless, except slightly cheaper on contract term. I feel like I should just copy-paste segments. Leonard was traded in the same damn deal Harkless was. He did next to nothing after that. When your most notable action is an accidental faux pas on a Twitch stream, I'm sorry, you're not worth my time. The New York Knicks and terrible free agency signings gel together as if they're Starsky and Hutch. Phil Jackson was in desperate need to jam the triangle offense into every orifice this organization had to offer. So in comes a weather-beaten Joakim Noah for way too much goddamn money. Nix, you know this guy's been suffering from injuries and steep decline the past two seasons, right? The deal went about as well as Phil Jackson's tenure with the Knicks. He lasted two seasons! If you exclude the 20-game drug suspension injury to end 2017 and a chasm between him and Jeff Hornacek, he played two seasons! His contract buyout finally ended this living hell. A great success story for everyone involved. New York also managed to nab Courtney Lee for four years and $12 million annually. The sad part is that Lee was one of the better contracts in terms of value in this entire class. I want you to let that soak in your brain for a moment. A guy performing decently as a role player is one of the better signings. It wouldn't save him from being traded in a cuss-cutting move along with Tingus Pingus, which blew up in everyone's face. Somehow, the Knicks didn't end up on the shittier end of it. How the hell did that happen? Harrison Barnes was the perfect example of someone who was going to be thrown a shitload of money that offseason. A young and rising core contributor on a championship team in Golden State? Who doesn't want that on their team? The Warriors didn't have the price he was paid. Dallas ponied the fuck up for him. 24 million dollars a year worth. To be fair, Barnes is a solid player, but he didn't emerge as a superstar as the Mavs were hoping. Kind of became maligned for it. Thus is why he went back to California in 2019. Unfortunately, it was to Sacramento and a cap dump for Dallas. They traded him during the middle of a game. It's not all bad though, Barnes got an extension for relatively the same pay grade by the Kings. Which, to be fair, they kind of have to do to keep anybody there. If someone says that he threw up when he saw the contract offer, that's a good sign someone is getting hideously overpaid. You can thank the Brooklyn Nets trying to poach an option away from another team. It was insanely backloaded, which Tyler Johnson didn't blink twice at. 
Johnson himself did all right in Miami, but that was when he was only being paid $5 million a year. Once that salary shot up to $20 million in the final two years, it's a bit harder to swallow his production under the guise of potential. He was traded to Phoenix for Ryan Anderson's anchor contract. And after that, he's had trouble trying to keep a roster spot anywhere. Just wasn't the same after he left the Heat. Injuries could have a bit to do with it. Ian Mahinmi had a career year in 2016 for the Pacers. Full-time starting big averaging almost 10 points and 7 rebounds a game? That's what the Washington Wizards need for their push. Do you know what that's gonna cost them? Almost $16 million a year for four years. For a guy who was a career backup until then. People didn't look at this deal as awful at the time of signing, but when Mahinmi became nothing more than his career backup form in Washington, not to mention oft injured, it was a disaster. And it was also a reason why the Wizards were handicapped in trying to support their superstar talents. They could never move him and he could never recapture what made him paid in 2016. His knees gave out on him so badly that he retired after the contract. Let's think positively though. With that salary, he may be able to afford a townhome in Arlington. Maybe. This is my primary example as to the horrors and excesses of the 2016 free agent class. Solomon Hill was a backup for the Pacers, coming off a terrible season where he struggled off the bench and was easily replaceable in any given lineup. However, he had a few playoff games where he was decent. What that means is that New Orleans was jumping at the bit to get him. My god, Peter, this man has a pulse! Someone sign him to a $12 million a year contract immediately! Hill's first year was okay, if you ignore the fact that he was getting shoved minutes every chance they had. After that, King Solomon apparently cut his talent in half. Turn hamstrings tend to fuck over a career in a league that relies on your legs. It became the albatross of albatrosses. New Orleans was stuck and couldn't do anything about it until the 2019 offseason, where he was traded to Atlanta in a draft day deal. Then flipped to Memphis in a terrible 2016 contract switcher road. He'll still in the league as a bench player at least, but he can take pride in a nice bank account. Sometimes all you need is a half-decent playoff run and someone will throw money at you. The Milwaukee Bucks were pretty poorly run at this point and were desperate to get back to some form of relevance. In hindsight, they did, but it wasn't because of deals like this. I'd like to think that Milwaukee pretended they had an NHL team with this deal because they paid almost $10 million a year for grit and sandpaper. A reminder, this was for Matthew Della Vadova. He was more Tony Snell in 2016-17 than Tony Snell was. And just did nothing. He was bad as a buck. So bad that he was traded back to Cleveland in a please take this player off our hands deal. They'd have been better off using the money for insulation. It got worse for them too. A career year with the Phoenix Suns in the mid 2010s should be taken with a pinch of salt. Remember, the Suns were a repetitive car crash back in that time frame. Milwaukee took the bait. Teletovic cashed in over $10 million a season for it. Even for this blessing, the injury gods did not care. He lasted one subpar season before being stricken with a knee injury and blood clots in his lungs. It forced his retirement after the season because life sucks. Oh, you thought this was it for Milwaukee? Keep digging. Miles Plumley got a four-year contract worth $50 million. A living, breathing GM paid Miles fucking Plumley $12.5 million a year. For Miles Plumley, a guy averaging five points and four rebounds in 14 minutes per game. The SEC should have immediately launched an investigation into this shit. This is borderline extortion. How else would a man be traded not even a year after signing the deal? Then be traded to Atlanta for them to shed Dwight Howard. Then traded to Memphis for the awful Chandler Parsons deal. Not one of the NBA's brightest moments. Speaking of Chandler Parsons... Mention this name to anyone in Memphis. I dare you. There will either be a silent bitter rage or a thousand yards there in response. In theory, the signing made sense with him being a three-point specialist that can hold down starting minutes. That was before the injury started taking him down. If win shares were based on knee issues, Parsons would have been a perennial all-star. His pass form was slowly beaten from him. He couldn't handle minute loads he could in the past, when he was even able to step onto the court. Parsons became a colossal liability through no fault of his own. The problem is no one gives a shit since they only see him making over $23 million a year. Yes, $94 million for four years. Pay to play game, baby. Just not with Parsons and his injuries. 
was eventually traded to Atlanta, limped to the end of his contract, and then retired. This was after a major car accident that nearly took his life in 2020. Jesus. Houston needed another three-point specialist to help to try and get them over the hump. And Ryan Anderson seemed like a good option for them to fill a starting role. The only downside was that he was getting paid $20 million a season for it. Then the injury started to take their toll. And then his production fell apart in year two. He fell out of favor with the Rockets, and Anderson felt immense pressure from the contract itself. Two years after signing, he was shipped off in a salary-shedding move. And then moved around the league like most other shitty contracts signed in 2016. He cashed in, but his best days were behind him. Nobody won here. Not even Houston. It's weird because the guy everyone criticized for not staying healthy and Eric Gordon stayed healthy for the most part in Houston. He was signed in this free agency class as well. He was cheaper too. And much more successful as a rocket. Funny how that worked out. Al Jefferson would have been a great signing five years earlier. The problem was that he was on the wrong side of 30 and experiencing decline. To replace Ian Mahinmi, he signs for about $10 million per year with the Pacers, toils as a backup to collect one last payday, and is waived after his second season. His best years were over, unfortunately. Dude was a shitwrecker in his prime, but by 2016? Just another statistic. Is it a bad thing that I didn't know who the hell John Luer was until I started researching this vid? Even in passing, I should have had some ideas to his name, but he slipped through the cracks. And another testament to how bonkers this free agency class was, this man also got over $10 million a season for four years. You may as well have called it the league minimum in 2016. In his first year, he did alright for Detroit. Four and a half win shares aren't anything to scoff at. But then came the injuries. He was wrecked so badly he didn't even play 50 games for the Pistons after his first year. An unfortunate flop who got traded for the legendary Tony Snell. Timberwolves paid a career backup big man seven and a half million per year. I don't know if you can even call Aldrich a backup, he wasn't even that for them. Cut from his contract after year two. The only positive is that he wasn't paid like Miles Plumley. Bismack Biombo had done absolutely nothing up to the point of signing his contract. However, he was tall and could breathe. That was good enough for Orlando to pay him 72 million dollars. If you've ever wondered why the Magic haven't done a damn thing for almost a decade, shit like this is why. He didn't regress or anything like that, but then Orlando realized that they paid 17 million dollars a year for Bismack Biombo. He was shipped off back to Charlotte for the dead contract of Timofey Mozgov. That's all that needs to be said. Biombo was useful to an NBA team, but at the 2016 rate? Dear God, that's embezzlement! Ironic since he's donating his season's salary to build a hospital in Africa. Insanity may have ended five years earlier, but don't tell that to the Brooklyn Nets. They still threw $12 million a year at him. In 2016. He spent the second season injured and the third year bouncing around from team to team. He did win a ring in Toronto, however. The greatest few minutes of playoff play the world has ever seen. Proof that dreams can come true. Hassan Whiteside had an excellent season, averaging a double-double and winning a spot on the NBA's all-defensive team. Miami, it's time to pay up. A lot more than you were expecting to. Four years and $98 million for one year of good production. Welcome to the money game. Fortunately, Hassan managed to do something that few in this class did. Maintain some semblance of form. It obviously wasn't good enough, and Whiteside was a bit of a malcontent in Miami, which ended up forcing a trade to Portland before the end. Even then, this contract, while vastly overpaid, offered a modicum of value. I hope he invested it wisely. With how his production has declined, he will more than likely never see $24.5 million per season again. The sad part is that this list is merely the worst of the worst. There were plenty more players that won the 2016 lottery, but I didn't want to give them attention because they weren't insanely egregious in comparison and this video would be an hour long if I did. This shit is long enough, and should be more than enough evidence that this free agency class broke the NBA. There were too many subpar players getting way too much money from dumbass executives getting into dick measuring betting wars with each other. Billions upon billions of dollars burned in effigy. It wrecked teams so badly that cap projections for 2017 dropped almost $10 million. Not to mention nearly all of these bad contracts were passed around like a ticking time bomb. 
mostly to the Hornets, Nets, and Hawks. It fucked future free agency classes for several seasons. And while the damage is past, it's still hilarious to reminisce about. It's not to say that there wasn't value in this class. LeBron got signed to a reasonable extension in Cleveland in comparison to what was given out. The hidden cost there was him holding the Cavs hostage and forcing them to pay his buddies a ridiculous sum in the process. Al Horford joined up with the Celtics and performed damn well for what they paid him. Bradley Beal was excellent for his extension, even though there's nothing around him in Washington. Evan Fournier performed well for what he was. D-Wade was okay...ish? Note that's the bar we're setting for this class. Barely passable is considered a success. The best move to make in hindsight was either sit out or get KD to sign with you. Pure disaster nearly everywhere you look. And that's what makes this class legendary. Consider this video as their graveyard. A moment of silence for the billions of dollars thrown away by most of these teams. Jalen Brown kicks it out. Smart fakes. Inside, Tatum spins and he cuts it in. Celtics go up by one. They wave it off. 